Okay, um, so welcome everyone to the Indigenous Agriculture Innovation Conference 2021. <laughs> My name is Candace Pete Cardozo and I'm from the Little Pine First Nation Treaty 6 Territory. I'm currently a director at the University of Saskatchewan, working within the Office of the Vice Provost of Indigenous Engagement. Previous to that, I worked within the College of Agriculture and Bioresources, and I managed a lands and resource training program for First Nation land managers from across Canada. I will be moderating the panel today. I'm very happy to be here and to be a part of these things. Well, I want to thank all of the speakers that have come before us that have set the stage for our discussion. Thank you to Thomas Benjo for providing an overview of the FHQ Development's Agriculture Strategy. Chief Cadmus Delore, Historical Aspects of Indigenous Agriculture in Saskatchewan. As well as to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Melissa Arcand, for an overview of research, current research in this field. The purpose of this panel is to focus on where we are now. We are going to be exploring the area of Indigenous business within the agriculture sector. Today, we have Jessica Nixon representing Cowessus First Nation. We have Albert DeRocher representing Flying Dust First Nation. And Kenneth Baer representing the Pasqua First Nation. Before we head into the questions, I'm going to hand off, I'm going to look to the panel members, introduce themselves, and just share a little bit more about who they are and how they came to be working in the Indigenous agriculture sector. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look, I'm going to start with Jessica. Jessica, introduction, please. Uh, thanks, Candice. Um, yeah, my name is Jessica Nixon. I'm currently the Director of Economic Development for Cowessus First Nation. Um, and within our portfolio, we have a, a mixed cattle and grain farm called 4C Farms. And I'm the project director for, I guess, all things kind of business and finance for the farm. Um, how did I get my start in Indigenous agriculture? Well, it was... Um, I, I guess it's be, because of my my childhood being raised on a mixed cattle and grain farm. And if I really go back, I think, you know, I was picking eggs at the age of five or six and, you know, working cattle at the age of eight and 10 and driving combine by 15, 16, right? Um, and and on, in my personal life, outside of my work employment with Cow Assist, my husband and I um, own um, a family farm where we have, um, you know, a cow calf herd as well as a grain farm of our own. So, you know, <laughs> as most of us looking around here in September, I should probably be on a combine right now. Um, but super pleased to be here today um, presenting and, and sharing kind of what we're up to with Cow Assist in my role working with the nation. So happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so next, I'm going to look to Ken. So I'm uh, from Ochapois, born and raised. Um, how I started in uh, agriculture uh, is a uh, ranch out in Sixika Nation. Um, my sister is married to uh, a band member from uh, the Blackfoot uh, Confederacy over there. And thankfully, they gave me a job at their ranch. And that's where I kind of fell in love with the land and died. And uh, never graduated high school, so uh, I came back to Saskatchewan from Alberta and attended uh, Saskatchewan Indian Federated College and then transferred to the University of Saskatchewan College of Agriculture. Um, got a degree in agronomy specializing in crops in May of 2000 and have been a registered professional agrologist since then and worked with a number of organizations, and I'm so happy to be working with Pasqua today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Now, Albert, we'll look to you for a bit of an introduction. Thank you. Well, I'll try not to take too much of anybody's time here, but um, uh, <clears throat> my name is Albert DeRocher, and I'm from the Flying Dust First Nation. I've been the uh, economic development advisor for Flying Dust for the past 21 years, 22 years now. I can't believe it's that long, but um, uh, we uh, had a uh, band farm since 1947. 
and uh, Flying Dust operated that farm right up until 2013 when we dissolved the business and handed over the acres we had to a couple of young farmers, a couple of young guys and families that wanted to get into farming. And they have uh, about 7,000 acres that they farm, the two, the two families. Then we have uh, six uh, cattle operators, cattle ranchers. We lease uh, land to them for uh, hay and uh, their uh, cattle. We have a market garden. Uh, it's a 172-acre uh, organic market garden. Uh, and we produce potatoes, uh, carrots, onions, beets, green peas, uh, fruits like strawberries and, and raspberries. And... Uh, we also have um, buffalo. So we have 60 head of buffalo and we've got them on a quarter section uh, plot. We uh, put new uh, fencing in for them, new calving station, stuff like that. So yeah, no, we're very proud of our agricultural history here on Flying Dust. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking to listen and hearing what the, the conference has to present. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for your introductions and sharing a little bit about who you are. And so as uh, we can see, everyone here is involved in various projects within the communities mentioned. So today is an opportunity for this group to share their perspectives on where we are now and to share with our audience their experiences, aspirations, and highlight some of the work they are leading or that they are involved with in these communities. So now we'll move into the into the questions. So the first question is, and I'm going to provide just a little bit of background and context before I put the question forward. First Nations have expressed a desire to take greater control over agricultural activities on their lands. Through modern large-scale commercial grain farming and ranching to reclaiming traditional practices on smaller scales to meet food security and sovereignty goals. Jessica, can you share with us the journey Kaosis has been on and some of the lessons learned along the way? Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I have to caveat by saying most of the history has, of course, been passed to me orally from folks in the community in terms of the history of, of, uh, of, of farming within Kaosis, um, dating back to the signing of treaty. And uh, so, so for many years, folks um, from Cowessis were active farmers, but, you know, due to the Indian Act and certain policies and programs put in place, as Chief Cadmus alluded to, um, it became prohibitive, right? And, and so up until kind of current day is when I can pick up the story is, you know, farming was on a sharp decline, not only in our nation, but in many um, where, whereby we essentially, <laughs> we, the, the number of farmers were on a decline, but actually the land base was e increasing because through treaty land entitlement and, and various settlements, we were actually increasing our acre count. And, and so, you know, we, it seemed to be a good path, right? We're, we're buying the land, we're renting it out. We're kind of getting fair market returns on our rent. We're getting a rate of return on that investment. But at the end of the day, we have to kind of step back and see like, who is benefiting from the land? It's meant to be the people of Cowessis and of every nation. And, uh, you know, if there's non-Indigenous farmers who are making and profiting, make, building successful businesses and profiting off the reserve land, why couldn't the nation do that, given that the land is the biggest asset, big, biggest capital expense um, that a farmer has to incur now? And, and we have that already there. So, um, 4C Farms started its journey um, as a community-owned cattle company back in 2010, um, where the community came together, bought 200 head of cattle, and the idea was to run a cattle herd and eventually, you know, train and mentor some of the youth to be able to take over small parts of that herd and grow their own, right? That was the concept. Um, what we found, though, was it was it was a challenge to bring those young folks on and inspire them to create their own herds within the community. So the original herd um, stayed intact since 2010. And so through that time, we had some folks through our own uh, community manage it. And then for a period of time, it was outsourced managed by a non-community member um, just just to ensure that the profit and, and uh, the cattle herd was maintained. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, when Chief Cadmus and our current leadership got involved, the question became, how can we take any of our existing investments and, and make it more profitable? And so we started to look internally and we brought back the operations of, first of all, the cattle farm internally um, and, and hired a, you know, a cow assist citizen to oversee that, um, somebody who had years of experience on their own and, and one of few folks in their community who actually had that experience uh, managing his own herd. Uh, so Terry Lara is, is our very valued ranch manager currently. Um, and so it's been a bit of an evolution, but you know, the interesting part about this was two things were happening at Cow Assist, um, in about 2017-18. Our existing pasture lands that the cattle had been grazing for the past, you know, seven, eight years had actually been pasture lands long before that. And they were coming to the end of their useful life and they really needed to be reworked worked and rejuvenated and reseeded down to cash crops to bring back their productivity. So we started doing that on some of our main kind of cattle ranch hands, lands. At the same time, chief and council said, what about all of this other like ideal prime pristine egg land that we have on the south side of the valley where the home reserve was? And uh, we should think about doing a business plan. And so chief and council embarked uh, on doing a business plan for just strictly a grain farm and, and looking at different levels, whether, you know, 4,000, 8,000, maybe 12,000 acre farms and, and what it would take for the community, um, the nation to invest in that. And so those two things were happening at the same time. And so we started slowly with some of that land, pasture land that we're working and getting into the cash crops. We had a couple challenging years um, just in terms of our internal business processes, the way, the way a nation manages a department or our lands branch manages land permits isn't the same way that a farm would be managed just in terms of how those purchasing decisions are made and how credit is set up and those types of things. So, so things are a bit of a challenge. Um, and then when we decided that, no, we actually need to run this more like a kind of an industry practice farm is when chief and kind of council kind of came and tapped on me and said, you know, Hey Jess, like, you know, this isn't really your role <laughs> um, as a director of ActDev, because I'm mostly focused on renewables and land development things. But, you know, you're a farmer and you're in your personal life. Like, what could we be doing at 4C Farms that would help us kind of run this farm more like a business? And, and that's kind of how we stumbled across my role in Indigenous agriculture was just my personal hands-on experience. And, and that's when we're able to bring in, um, I'd say, more industry practice just in terms of how we were procuring our inputs and how we were financing them um, and, and operating it more like a farm and less like a band department. So, so that's a little bit of our history, but gosh, I don't know if that answered your question about like, where are we at now and where was the journey we're at to today? Um, I, I mean, there's lots I could talk about, but I want to leave the opportunity for the other panelists as well. Thank you very much, and and for sure you've answered the question. And the thing that I find really valuable, and thank you for sharing sharing the story with us. I I really love to hear about um, your your points in terms of benefits to Kawasis, uh community to the community of Kawasis First Nation, and as well as some of the important messaging about training and mentoring youth. That's really important. Um, as well as talking about the opportunities for community members, I think that is a, a, a very well said story. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm going to go to Albert. So thinking about the same question, can you share with us your thoughts on the path that Flying Dust has been on? Share with us some of the projects that have been undertaken by your nation. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that uh, thanks, Jessica, for that overview. And uh, um, I guess with Flying Dust Journey, um, you know, we've been doing this for many, many years. Uh, like I said, our band farm started in 1947. Um, and we've had uh, the same group of families operating and managing uh, that band farm for us. Because, again, farming is a lifestyle. It's not something that... Um, you know, just anybody can come into and say, oh, I'm going to be a, a farmer or a rancher. It's something that you, you really got to love. It's something that you really have a passion for. And so for us being, you know, close to the, to the land and being a farming community, you know, we've been able to instill um, that agricultural feel within our, our youth. So again, as I reiterated la earlier, we have two young farmers and uh, and they've been farming now for the past seven years. 
and their operations are growing larger and larger. As we know in, in farming and in agriculture, the, the farms are getting bigger in order to be more efficient. It's economies of scale. Um, so for us, we stepped back and we, we started concentrating more on our market garden, which for us was more of a food sovereignty initiative as compared to an economic development initiative. But we've been able to, um, you know, sell our produce at a, at a good rate to at least offset some of the costs. During the summer, we employ 20 people. And for the past 10 years, uh, a lot of the people that have gone to work at the Market Garden have gone on to other jobs. Um, you know, just doing the life skills with them, uh, you know, um, having them understand the ideals behind reliability, responsibility showing up on time, you know, being committed, all those things that, you know, those values that uh, are needed to be instilled sometimes in our young people. And it's really been a great avenue for us to put our young people into different jobs, whether it's in our gravel company or our gas station or, you know, just the other entities we have. And then we got into Bison three years ago. And again, that's more for food sovereignty. So, we just uh, purchased and installed uh, two large walk-in freezers and one large walk-in cooler into our market garden so that, um, you know, our potatoes last us right until April and, uh, you know, the, we're in our storage. And then we just, we take our youth hunting. So we take girls hunting one time and then we take the boys hunting uh, a couple of times. And then we take everyone fishing too with our youth. So they they do that. So, and, and what we tell them is it's for the rest of the community. So when they learn how to shoot the animal, dress the animal, and then bring it home, and then we provide food to our, our members, right? So that's all part and parcel. Um, and, and again, I guess uh, moving forward, I mean, we're always looking for opportunity as we as we know, and I think we'll be talking about it here is there's a lot of opportunity in the food processing business and, and doing a value add to the products that we have, for instance, like with the potatoes, you know, we've been asked many times, why don't you just start making French fries and freeze drying them and then and then marketing them. And uh, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It's a it's an organic product that we produce. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it costs money, right? So um, we're always looking for different uh, different uh, opportunities. Um, and again, I alluded to another one last time when we talked about grain drying systems and, and working with a manufacturer that uh, develops and builds these grain drying systems. Again, just another great business opportunity for a First Nation to get involved with. I hope that answered your question. Very much so. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And um, again, some important messaging. And I really love the messaging around farming and your comments about family and uh, that farming is, is a lifestyle. I really appreciate that. I also grew up on the farm and grew up um, in the agriculture, working in the agricultural area with my farm, uh, with my family from a really young age. So I really appreciate that. Um, so on to the, on to the second question. So we've talked about lessons learned and opportunities. Let us shift our gears a little bit here. It'd be interesting to hear about the current state when it comes to policy frameworks and how these can either enable or inhibit agricultural activity in community. So Ken, can you please share with us your thoughts on, on this? Okay, this one was really, really important for me. Um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, they asked me to sit on this National Policy Advisory Committee for the non-BRM program. So, no, for the Business Risk Management Program, sorry. So, this is Agri-Stability, Ag-Invest, Agri-Recovery, and I believe the other one was... Um, I can't remember, but there was four kind of divisions under this business risk management. So I gladly wanted to sit on this National Policy Advisory Committee just to kind of give a, a First Nations perspective. And so they identified me as a Saskatchewan producer, um, but 
I kind of identified myself as an indigenous uh, producer, um, an indigenous agrologist uh, at this national level. And I wanted to highlight the fact that when the BSC hit Saskatchewan and Canada, a lot of First Nations weren't participating in the income support program. And because they weren't participating in this income support program, they weren't able to receive the benefits from that BSC when the market kind of crashed. And so it made me think, okay, well, who is in office in these business risk management programs are encouraging First Nations to participate. So First Nations Ag Council of Saskatchewan, back then, it's no longer in existence, but back then we encouraged First Nations across Saskatchewan to participate in this income support program called AgriStability. So they started to apply for it. They were getting letters in the mail from Agri Stability asking for income tax information. And we communicated with the federal government and the provincial government that the First Nations on a reserve, they didn't need to file uh, income tax uh, because of their treaty right. And so this kind of made these farmers that had cattle a little bit reluctant to reapply because they were afraid that they were going to have to pay something back if they received it. So we were kind of at a, a crossroads in terms of how can we verify specific information you know, submitted to these business risk management program programs. And that that's still the way it is today. You know, so if you were looking at in 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 uh, participating in agro stability as a farmer, what uh, what does that look like specifically for a first nation? Does that mean that somebody that has five head of cows is considered to be a farmer? Is that somebody that has 75 acres of land or even 60 acres of land, can they participate in the business risk management programs? That kind of is not clear. So another thing is you go and register your vehicle as a farm vehicle. They request you to say that you're going to make this amount of income. And how do you verify that income? Mm -hmm. So kind of up to an SGI person in that town to say, yeah, no, we don't believe you're a farmer. You know, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like not really clearly defined out there, you know, that... Uh, who can and who can't participate in the agro stability or the business risk management programs. I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd just like to expand a little bit on a conversation that we, we started a little bit earlier. So let's talk a little bit more about the challenges. And I think that for our audience, Let's think about maybe some of the advice and guidance that you might want to provide to those that are watching and, and have joined us today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Jessica. And if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so I think some of the, some of the challenge, like I'll, I'll just kind of list the, the to kind of topic areas and maybe I can touch back on them, but, but scale. Um, so, so scaling up growth economies of scale, what is the right size to justify investment for a community? I think that's a question. Um, another question is capitalization. Where does the money come from <laughs> to fund the capital intensive nature of primary production grain farming? I'm specifically talking about grain. Um, and, and then the next one is where does the expertise come from? How does a nation retain the expertise needed to get the operation going? And then secondly, 
how do we how do we mentor in some of our youth? And and there's you know we we've we've been at this for a few years. We can we can speak to that. Um, and then then there's this whole piece around like governance and decision makings that play into the operations. And so so <clears throat> currently, Cowis is um, through our Four C Farms initiative. We you know like I mentioned earlier, we started with 200 head of cattle in 2010 you know, through culling and, and that type of thing that the herd size had actually dwindled. Um, and in 2018, we had about 150 head of cattle and about 700 acres of grain land. Today, this year in 2021, our cattle numbers are at about 120 cattle and we're farming 4,500 acres of land. And so this past year, we did a huge growth jump. We went from 1,350 seeded acres last year to 4,500 seeded acres this year. And that was a juggling act to make that happen. But where did it start? So, so I know some nations um, and some farmers, quite frankly, they will like they will pick a target number and say like to be to have the economies of scale we need to justify a full time employee or two and the equipment we need to be farming five thousand acres and they'll start at that. So Kawasis took a slightly different approach because we had some assets and we started building on that. So we started really small in 2019. We bought. We needed to buy some equipment, right? So we bought our first 9,600 combine. We bought a, a case swather and haybine. And we had some old balers to put up our own feed. And we just bought a couple key pieces of equipment, an old 1979 grain truck, right? That's what we were starting with. And, uh, and, and that's what we did our 700 acres with. Then when we decided, no, we want to expand and we want to move to the south side, um, we put out an ad and we were looking for somebody who had grain farming expertise and management. And, and we were lucky enough to have somebody with an agrology background who was young and interested in starting a farm from outside of the community come in and want to join. And so we brought them in on a contract basis. And the concept that we're currently running under right now is that non-Indigenous individual is responsible under a contract basis and paid per acre for the functions he uses his equipment to do for us. In the meantime, we have our own equipment. We have our own combine. We've recently purchased our own semi and grain truck and our own four-wheel drive tractor and grain cart. And so, so it's, a, it's a distribution of work. We use part of our own equipment to assist the work, and then he just we just pay him per acre on the work that he does for us. And so it's a bit of a hybrid model. So we have him and some of his crew members, and then we have our equipment and some of our own community citizens working for the farm, and it, it's currently a hybrid. The long-term goal, like this helps with one of those issues I mentioned earlier, it helps with growth. We're not taking it all on ourselves. We're kind of spreading out that risk, bringing in that expertise. And secondly, it helps with capitalization. We don't need to go out and buy a $5 million fleet of equipment to farm 4,500 acres in our first year out. You know, rather than that, this year we were able to pick up you know, we, we, we purchased eight new grain bins. We were, we're setting up a bin site um, more, where our, more where our new kind of grain area is. Um, we picked up a new semi and trailer. And so it's this, again, I just want to reiterate, it's a bit of a hybrid model that works for us and it's going to be different for every nation. But the, the biggest challenge that everybody has is buying equipment and finding the expertise to get to that point. And so... Um, Funding is a big thing. If you look at a farm, like I'll just stop for a second. <clears throat> how an individual farm, so like how my husband and I run our farm is, <clears throat> my husband doesn't take a wage and I come to work for a reason, right? Um, there's off farm income there. And, and, and the way it works is everything that the farm makes goes right back into the farm, right? There's not like a dividend paid out. There isn't big wages paid out. And so the farm kind of has good years and it has bad years. That's, that's how an industry farm works. Now, how do we translate that to a First Nation-owned farm where the community is expecting some sort of dividend potentially or payback? Because quite frankly, we're doing this as an economic development initiative. And the message to leadership really needs to be the goal is to get to the point where this farm can pay a dividend or a distribution. But that might be five to 10 years down the road because as you're just looking at that growth mode, every single little piece of profit generated needs to go back in to be able to get to the equipment, to get to the size needed to be profitable. And so that's where we're really fortunate in the leadership that we have at Cowasis is, you know, we've, we've sat down, we've had those conversations and they believe, they really believe that the, over the 100,000 acres that Cowasis owns, that we should be farming a significant portion of that. 
but how are we ever going to get there if we try and take money out of it before it even can be successful? So we're really fortunate to have leadership that's patient, has kicked in some own source revenue to get us going. Um, and quite frankly, that own source revenue was utilized to be able to go leverage debt to buy the equipment that we need. Um, so it's like a bit of this balancing act. So so I guess to anybody out there who's sitting on a chief in council thinking about starting a farm, this is this is not a one to two year deal and make money and, and get out some dividends. This is like a 10 to 20 year plan that's about growing a farm that can be sustainable where there would be the dividend in the end. So I'll just kind of put that concept there. And then the next concept that I'd put in is how do we leverage financing? Because uh, like I you know, there's this misconception out there that First Nation communities have millions of dollars in the bank that we're just, you know, trying to decide how to invest it. That is not the case. I mean, every business or active deal we do, we are trying to leverage financing to the max, minimize the amount of equity we're putting in and finding grant sources to help us along the way. And so agriculture is no different. And, um, you know, I'm just thankful that the federal government right now has actually put a strong focus on, you know, I consider myself lucky to be working in agriculture, renewable energy, and in, and indigenous indigenous economic development right now because the feds have put a huge emphasis on that. And we can be really thankful for programs like the Indigenous Agriculture Food Systems Initiative um, that is here to help First Nation communities launch their farming initiatives. And so, um, you know, we're really proud to sit here today and say 4C Farms is a recipient of the Agriculture Canada uh, Indigenous Agriculture Food Systems Grant Program. Um, we're, we're on a three-year project right now, um, and, and the project was all about expanding. So we started with a small cattle herd, a small grain base, and our proposal to them is we want to grow to be a grain farm that is economically viable at an industry level, and that's where we went to the 4,500 acres. And so their assistance um, helped us offset things like wages, um, for our community members who work on the farm, right? Coming back to that challenge, the challenge being if you're paying out wages, it's hard to be profitable, right? Um, so, so they help offset wages. They help offset some of our capital equipment expenses, right? So they give us a portion that's enough to kind of get that equity needed to go talk to folks like the fine folks at Farm Credit Canada and say, hey, can we get financing for the rest of this piece of equipment, right? Um, and, and, and then some other contract admin type supports on our expertise team, they help assist with. So, so, so I would say anybody who's looking to embark on it, get a really good plan, um, invest some money, talk. I mean, Myers Norris Penny helped cow assist with our original grain farming business plan. Talk to some of these resources, get a plan that's realistic to figure out what your capital needs are, and then go look for grant funding out there. And it exists if you have the right team and the right plan in place. So I'd say that's a, another really big one. Um, the other one that as we sit here today and, and with Cowasis farming 4,500 acres, um, over the last three years, we've, so we're in year one of three with Ag Canada coming into it. Um, and we're at, in our final year of three years on a CEF uh, contribution program. So the Saskatchewan Indian Equity Foundation. Um, and again, they, they saw that we had existing assets, we had existing financial statements, but we wanted to take that next step and we needed equipment to do that. So CIF, um, we, we qualified under the CIF program, which again, helped offset 30% of some of our capital equipment purchases, again, giving us that seed equity needed to go get the debt financing. So, so those programs really, really helped. Quite frankly, we never, ever, ever could have got to where we are today unless we had those programs or the band was going to kick in a huge chunk of money. Um, because the, the farm itself wasn't generating the return that it needed to get to that growth level. Um, so, so I just want to mention those really important um, pieces. Um, and then the next piece that's super critical on this is debt financing. So historically, 4C Farms hasn't carried very much debt. Um, but as we were looking to get our inputs every spring and, and enable our, rent, our farm manager you know, to go to the co-op in Broadview or go to Nutrien in Grenfell, and get the, the products that they needed, we need to be able to set up these large li uh, lines of credit to be able to charge our seed, fertilizer, and chemical to. So, you know, sitting down with FCC to get those financing um, arrangements in place took, again, a good plan and people behind the plan to be able to execute it. Um, and there were some intricacies, right, um, as it relates to uh, 
to, to, to the Indian Act overriding the Bank Act, right? They can't come on to reserve property and, and use, they can't seize those assets, right? Under traditional lending methods. So our chief and counsel had to sign off um, saying that if we default on a piece of equipment or a loan payment, that we actually grant that finance our ability to come on reserve to seize that asset that we've put up as collateral. So, um, so it takes give and take, right? We, we want to do business. We want to participate in industry, but we have all of these policies that we're bound by. And so it takes, again, a leadership who wants to make that happen um, and is willing to sign off to say, yep, we, we get that we need, to, uh, we need to put this piece of equipment as collateral. That's the only way it's going to work. Or we need to sign a banned corporate guarantee over this package of financing. Um, so so those, are, those are the aspects that everybody needs to be thinking of is uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to put together all the financing um, and, and the economics of a deal to get to the point where, you know, you can kind of say to your ranch manager, okay, you have $750,000 of credit, go buy the inputs we need, right? Or here's the equipment, off you go, and all that's kind of looked after. Um, it's a bit of a different role than the person actually executing. And so that, that's kind of where I help cow assist. Um, but there's many other folks that could help the nation's um, do that type of work to get going. And I'm just primarily talking about grain farming. Um, but, you know, Albert, you might have some really good insights about how you guys got your greenhouse up and going and off the ground or how you got your bison operation up and off the ground and if you had some of these similar hurdles, right? Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's, you really laid that out great, Jessica. Thank you for that. Um, uh, yes, you've you. hit on the, the major points uh, in terms of, what those challenges are when you're starting any type of uh, agricultural uh, endeavor, whether it's in grain farming, whether it's in uh, food processing, whether it's in uh, um, uh, cattle and, and bison. So a really good layout there of, of the challenges. From our own experience, um, you know, the, the market garden uh, was a low cash outlay. However, we did uh, receive some money from Agri-Food Canada. They had called it the Indigenous Agricultural Initiative uh, back in 2013 when we applied. Um, we were able to secure $1.2 million to build our storage facility. So we had a state-of-the-art storage facility. And then again in 2017, uh, we used our own source revenue to add another 20,000 square feet uh, so we could house our equipment. All our equipment is uh, electric. Um, there is no diesel or gas equipment in our in our market garden. Um, our bison we negotiated with um, uh, Elk Island uh, National Park in Edmonton, and then we had to spend about a hundred thousand dollars again of own source revenue to. Um, develop and, and um, <clears throat> accommodate those bison. In terms of, uh, uh, you know, some of the other challenges, uh, it costs around three to $400,000 a year, depending on, on uh, the market, uh, to operate our market garden. Uh, and the chief and council made a decision a long time ago, 10, 12 years ago, that we were going to support this this project 100%, and we have. Um, they've been really fully supportive. Our finance staff has been really fully supportive uh, from our business end to contribute those dollars because we feel it's a real need. And as you know, with climate change going on, um, you know, water issues and drought in southwestern United States, California is being affected. Um, you know, they've got water issues in Florida where oranges and a lot of other stuff is grown. So we've got to be mindful of that as, as Canadians and as Indigenous people that, you know, 70% of all our food comes from what we eat, what we consume comes from the United States or Chile or Mexico, right? So again, uh, we're at the mercy sometimes of, of these different groups in different countries. Um, just to talk about a little bit on the framework side to uh, what Ken was talking about, um, the government of mm -hmm. Canada and their agriculture department came out with a document called Room to Grow, and they had 18 recommendations on there. And one of their recommendations uh, was to work with Indigenous um, 
groups, whether it's in the north uh, with the Inuit or, um, you know, the, the First Nations and Métis in, in the southern part of the country. Um, the, the infrastructure that's required to help and assist, and Ken, you could probably elaborate more on this, but the infrastructure that's required to assist these First Nations in getting started, again, um, I think uh, that we need to take a look at how can we assist um, Indigenous groups that want to get involved in any type of agricultural initiative, but more importantly, in, in, in the growing side of things, in the producing side, is the infrastructure that's required. Again, Jessica elaborated on it, like the bins, you know, the equipment, getting all that, that debt financing that's required. But I think, um, you know, if the government of Canada is, is really serious about, you know, the future of agriculture in Canada, we're missing a, the boat right now when it comes to the opportunities that are there, specifically in the food processing, uh, the protein industry, the protein super cluster that they have going. Um, you know, there's, there's some huge opportunity right now. And I think uh, one of the beautiful things about uh, an, an Indigenous First Nation that wants to get into agriculture, they have agricultural land. They have lots of arable land that isn't being used right now. You know, that could do yeah. a crop such as soy or wheat or canola, you know, and then having sustainable production. Um, you know, uh, the University of Saskatchewan has some great programs, some great, and University of Regina, but specifically Regina, University of Saskatchewan has some great programs in terms of how to talk and or work with sustainable uh, agriculture, right? Um, you know, these are the things that I think we need to be looking at. Again, um, on the funding side, I think there's more room there that the government of Canada could do to assist First Nations. Again, we got to be mindful, um, you know, the farming community um, as well, the, the existing agricultural producers, they benefit a lot from a lot of government initiatives, but not to the extent where it's making them be millionaires. They're, they're just like, as Jessica said, there's up and down years. It's like any commodity industry that, that's out there, whether it's oil and gas, potash, yeah. whatever, you've got your up and down years. And so you have to plan there. You have to be able to forecast 10, 20 years into the future how that's going to look and how you're going to make a benefit to the community. I think the biggest benefit is utilizing your own land instead of it just sitting there and not producing anything. That's number one. Number yeah. two is food sovereignty and creating products, produce, grains, berries, fruits, whatever, right, to sustain the community and surrounding communities. You always want to share with your neighbors, like our market garden, we donate to the food banks, Regina, Saskatoon, Prince Albert, Yorkton, Meadow Lake, North Battleford, Lloyd Minster. We give potatoes to all of those groups. It's just part of our, our philosophy here. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time because I know, Ken, you've got some, some stuff that I know you could, you'd want to talk about here. But I guess the, the long story short of it is on a challenges side, it's, it's all about trying to find the right people, you know. Um, again, yeah. finding the right group of people. Um, farming is a lifestyle, and you've got to find the people that want to do it. Um, you could run any type of business, if you, even a gas station. But if the person doesn't know, know how to run a gas station, then you wouldn't hire them. Or if they didn't like doing that, you wouldn't hire them. It's got to be um, somebody that, that understands it, that understands the commitment. When, when cows are calving in, in March and February and it's, you know, cold outside and they need a safe place to be, you got to get up in the middle of the night and, and, and go and take care of that calf. You know, these are the things that people sometimes don't understand. But at the end of the day, you need to have that commitment. You need to have that sense of responsibility. So, again, that's just part of my advice again. <laughs> Thanks so much, Albert, and some great advice and guidance. And I love the overview of some of the challenges that you've faced and how you've worked to overcome them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to go forward with, with one of our last questions. And so and I'm going to look to Ken to answer this one. Where do you see First Nations fitting into the agriculture industry in the next five to 10 years? Thank you for the question. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank so, you. So every sector, every sector that you could think of in agriculture, I see First Nations fitting in. Now, Egg Nutrient Solutions, Vitera, Co-op, wherever, you know, research, universities, um, just, just agri-stability, you know, offices out in uh, Melville, um, agrologists, more agrologists, you know, we're selling, we're selling equipment, you know, we're fixing the equipment, we're teaching, we're, we're training, you know, just a number of areas like we're producing, you know, things that uh, I don't see today. You know, I'm hoping that my kids have the opportunity, you know, and they feel inclusive or they feel like, you know, they can go and work at uh, Vitera in Grenfell, that that's an opportunity for them, that they actually see themselves fitting, you know, in the sector. But it's not really a defined sector per se for First Nations people, because there's a lot of negative associations with agriculture, you know, and yes. it's the negative, you know, things that I'm challenged with. Like when Albert was talking, you got to have a passion for this, you know, and I am very passionate, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have stuck with the College of Agriculture, you know, being the only student at the time when I went, you know, I had to really feel, you know, that I was there for a specific reason. And nobody was teaching me that there. They taught European agricultural history. There was nothing in relation to indigenous agriculture back then. And so I more or less had to reach out and ask, like, how can I learn about First Nations agriculture? Well, somebody said Sarah Carter wrote this book called Lost Harvest. I read it. And then in there, I'm reading things like the Peasant Farming Act. I'm reading things that First Nations were forced to do agriculture in residential schools. And then I start really seeing, okay, now I understand why I'm the only Indian self-identified at the College of Agriculture. And so my first job was with Farm Credit Canada out of university. And the first thing that I requested information from people that wanted to borrow money was their past three years income tax records. I come from the reserve that I never seen my mom or dad fill out any income tax records. So this was brand new to me. And then so they start calling me chief, you know, in Farm Credit Canada. And I wasn't a chief, you know, and my brother Cadmus is a chief, you know, and he earned that by getting all of the votes. But, you know, for myself, when he told me and he said that to me, I just, just knew that they weren't ready for Indigenous people. And I still don't think a lot of organizations are ready for Indigenous people. But we're here. I'm here. My kids are here. And we have so much land that we could be the biggest, biggest player in the agricultural sector across Canada, across the world. You know, we just got to realize that this asset, this land asset that we have, you know, is what non-First Nations farmers are looking for right now. They want more land. Us, we have more land, but we just don't have the support to farm it ourselves. So... Once we start connecting those dots, you know, and we get more inclusive support and more an understanding support system, you know, because the provinces are arguing with the federal government right now for things that they want. Well, who's arguing for First Nations to get, you know, their portion of this agriculture and agri-food next policy framework money? I'm not sure if anybody's arguing for it, but I would definitely yeah. argue for it. 
you know, and I think that that's kind of where, you know, we need people to have a better understanding, you know, that uh, agriculture is a very humble kind of thing, you know, and like Albert is saying, you know, we're not really in it for the big, big money, you know, but, you know, we're in it because it's it's something that connects us to the land. And I believe that our connection is stronger than anybody else's. Well said. I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank really you. well said, Ken. Thank you very thank you very much for that. And I think we have a bit of an opportunity. Jessica and Albert, do you want to add anything more in when we think about the future of agriculture and our communities? Um, I'm just Ladies really first. excited to have organizations like FCC and SAS Crop Insurance and and folks say, tell us more. <laughs> what can we do? How can we become more engaged in seeing folks hiring more Indigenous folks, even if they don't have a background in agriculture? We'll teach it to you, but, you know, <laughs> bringing them into the organization. So so it's just really nice to see that happening. Um, we encourage more of it. And, uh, you know, I echo what Ken said here at the end is um, all the organizations have more work to do and, and uh, the opportunity is endless. So let's get on. Let's get on the on the train. Thanks very much, Albert. Yeah, I just wanna add that I think one of the things sometimes is we forget is, you know, indigenous people have a long history being farmers, thousands of years, you know, we harvested corn, we harvested grains, we grew all these things. And we need to remind our young people of that, that we have a proud history in agriculture, that we were excellent and are excellent farmers. And, you know, we haven't lost that. That's still ingrained within our culture, within our traditions. And that has to be, that has to be um, addressed and identified for our young people to be more um, involved and wanting to be involved in agriculture. But I want to talk about just a couple things real quickly before we, we close. And that is the opportunities that are being availed to First Nation communities right now through Agriculture Canada through the Canada Infrastructure Bank for infrastructure to develop more um, uh, agricultural-based uh, products and, and, and services. Um, you know, there's protein. Again, I brought up the protein clusters. That's another great opportunity. You know, that's a business opportunity for us. Again, today, you t you've seen the announcement and, uh, well, I should say, well, there, there was an announcement on uh, SASC mining and minerals for the sulfate of potash and them using potash, the, the sulfate of potash to market down in the states where there's a large market and need, but we're gonna need that here once the um, irrigation project gets into place, right? Where we wanna grow different types of fruits and vegetables that our climate here can control. Um, again, I think FCC, uh, has some work to do, but they, they're wanting to learn. You know, they our good friend Sean Sunias and uh, Milton Grey Eyes are both working there right now and trying to change the landscape in that area, and, and, and kudos to them. And, and kudos to all the First Nations that are out there right now trying to find a better way for their communities in, in regards to farming and food sovereignty. I mean, you got the Thunderchild First Nation. You got Kawasis, you've got Beardies, you've got Red Pheasant, you know, a lot of the southern communities that want to get involved because they have a lot of arable land. That's our commodity. The land is the thing that is going to help us address some of these issues, number one. Number two is sustainability. You know, we've got a great agricultural focused uh, university at the University of Saskatchewan. And they've got all types of programs and services to assist when you need help. You know, um, again, utilizing someone like MNP, that's important, but they're only one company. I mean, there's others that do that. Um, and again, there's indigenous companies that do that. So, you know, I think when we're talking to the, to the folks that want to get into agriculture, the sky's the limit. It's how you want to vision it. How, what's your mission, what your goals and objectives are. And once you can identify those and highlight them, then, then the action items are a lot easier to, to attain, right? And so 
again, having a good solid plan, like Jessica said, and to get the funding or the financing that's required to start your business off. For individuals, um, again, uh, I, Ken, I, I hear you, and I and I and just from our own experience here, some of our small farmers don't want to register with the provincial government to get that money because then they start getting into your business and they want you to start paying tax. And the thing is, is the argument always from the provincial government is, well, you're selling, you're marketing your product off reserve. Meanwhile, 95% of the time that animal was being grown and, 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 and what do you call produced uh, was on the First Nation. But because you're marketing it off reserve, well, then it's subject to taxation. So again, maybe it's we start our own marketing group that's in a First Nation base. And, and as you said, start marketing to different countries and different groups. Um, you know, I mean, that's just an option. Um, again, a lot of our, I know our farmers aren't doing that. They, they don't want to have people coming in and saying, well, you sold a, a cow and calf for $1,500 and we're going to take $700 of it. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the use then, right? I mean, there, there's no incentive there then. Again, climate has a huge change here. This year's a great example. Feed, right now we're culling calves, we're culling cows because, uh, you know, it's $150 a bale. And you need six bales to feed a cow over the winter. That's $900. And you're going to sell that cow for $1,400, but it costs you $600 to, to buy it in the first place or buy it in the first place. So you're losing money. So, I mean, again, at the end of the day, there's got to be some commitment from the provincial and federal governments to work with our indigenous uh, corporations, our indigenous farmers, to make that an, an option for them to be able to be sustainable. And that's my, my final thought. Some great final thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, what I want to do is I want to thank our panel members for sharing with our audience and for sharing with us your journey, for talking about some of the challenges. And I really appreciated listening to the advice and guidance. And most importantly, I really enjoyed, and I'm sure audience enjoyed hearing about some of the opportunities when we think about the agricultural sector and our communities. So thank you very much um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.